Now we've got a full program tonight. I'm going to go ahead and cut right to our keynote speaker. And tonight's opening, we're open to tonight's ceremonies, <clears throat> tonight's ceremonies with, a keynote, with a special speaker, Jake Tapper. Jake possesses a long and distinguished resume in the field of broadcast journalism. And for those of you seeking an in-depth knowledge of all things Jake Tapper, I will refer you to the book on the back inside today's program. For our immediate purposes, however, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, the Jake Tapper for dummies to employ a common cartoon device. Jake currently is the White Hat Chief White House Correspondent for ABC News, having taken that post following Barack Obama's election in November 2008. He played a key role in the network's coverage of, the President, of President Obama's inauguration and in the process won an Emmy for outstanding coverage of a current news story. He's a regular contributor to Good Morning America, Nightline, This Week, and World News with Diane Sawyer. Additionally, he has offered two book, authored two books and is currently working on a third. He swears me out just reading this. Runs a blog called Political Bunch and is active on Twitter. In fact, we can, say, we can thank a series of tweets between Jake, who confesses an affinity for all things for cartooning in general, and our own Matt Bores, who pre, who's, for his presence here tonight. Uh, will you please welcome Jake Tapper? Thank you so much. Matt was sending me really obnoxious tweets. Uh, that's what happened. He wanted, and he wanted credit for it. He was challenging me, and I, and I appreciated it. And when I realized who this rude young man was, where is Matt? And then I went, and oh my God, it's Matt Boris. I know his work. Um, and I, uh, he had done a, a, a strip, or a cartoon rather, um, in which he had satirized other cartoonists' style and it was uh, Ramirez, and I was like, is that supposed to be Ramirez? And immediately, the geek bond of cartooning tra <laughs> transcended all other d discussions we had been having. Oh my God, he knows I was trying to do Ramirez's work and satirizing that, and like, we geeked out. And I was able to geek out tonight so much talking, you know, just me and just meeting people whose who's, um, signatures in the bottom right-hand corner I've known for decades, uh, uh, Starting with uh, Steve Kelly, who as a, a former Dartmouth cartoonist, he preceded me uh, by a few years, and, and uh, I, I was in his shadows at Dartmouth when I did my uh, comic strip for the Daily Dartmouth, and then just other names I've known, whether it's Tom Tomorrow or Tom Tolls, who I know from um, Washington, D.C., and, and I remember telling my dad when, uh, after the late, great Herblock died, uh, that guy from Buffalo is going to get that job, and, and uh, I, I know this world so well because I am a failed cartoonist. Um, uh, and it's okay, you don't have to feel bad for me. I'm, I'm doing okay, but, but, uh, but I, I want to know, I want you to know that I know this world so much and, and I really love and appreciate uh, what you do. I, I tried to get a, a comic strip syndicated um, and met with Lee Salem of Universal Press Syndicate. I ran into him a few years ago and, and he, again, it was like the he didn't feel too bad for me kind of thing, but, but um, I, I really wanted to do what you guys are doing. Um, and so I do truly envy the fact that you, I know it's a tough time for, uh, for cartooning and it's a tough time for, for journalism in general, um, but I mean, I know Charles Schultz and Walt Kelly, I know the Okie Finoki, I know Coco Nino, I know um, the dreams of Little Nemo, I remember the moment that I realized that Oliphant was better than McNally, I remember... <laughs> hey! I'm sorry if there was a, was a Tribune person here. I apologize. He was great. I'm just saying he wasn't as good as Oliphant. Uh, Trudeau over Breathed and, and uh, Tintin over Asterix. And, and uh, um, I'm from... Come on. Someone's going to side with Asterix over Tintin? That's crazy. Again, Asterix is great, but I mean... Anyway, so... Um, I'm from Philadelphia, so in Philadelphia, I befriended as, as an eighth grader, uh, Tony Auth, and he was, he's not here tonight, obviously, but he was so generous with his time, as, you, as probably a lot of you know, he's a magnificent person and just very sweet. Um, my dad, who is here uh, and has accosted several conservative cartoonists here tonight, is my understanding, I apologize for that, does not reflect my opinions, which are, you know, locked in a vault somewhere, but... but um, my dad got involved in, in a charity Tony Auth was involved in um, for a homeless in Philadelphia. 
and purchased many, many editorial cartoons, probably uh, some of whom uh, were drawn by people here tonight uh, to, to benefit the homeless and uh, were lined the offices of his uh, pediatric office in Philadelphia for many, many years until he retired this year. Uh, so he, and he, he supported my cartooning career, such as it was. I did a, a, a comic strip for Roll Call for uh, eight years, and um, I did caricatures for newspapers here and there, but never actually got the break that a lot of you guys got. Uh, and and uh, so, seriously, it, it, uh, I don't ask for your pity, but I want you to know I really do envy what you do. I think it is, it is magnificent. It is important for this republic. Um, there are two categories of, of failed cartoonists. One is your cousin Gus, uh, who lives in his parents' be uh, basement. And the other uh, I would like to put myself in is, is uh, Hugh Hefner and Tom Wolfe and John Updike and uh, Jim Henson. Uh, somebody told me, uh, Tom told me, uh, Chuck D apparently is a failed cartoonist. Jimmy Kimmel told me uh, that he's a failed cartoonist. So there are some of us out there who manage to, to scrape by anyway. But, but I, I, I do want you to know that I miss it. Um, I, I had a, a cartoon off with Cal uh, yesterday and realized how awful and how atrophied my cartooning muscles have gotten. Of course, many of us probably feel that way when we compare our work to Cal's, but, but uh, uh, it, it, is a, it is truly an honor to be here. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I was told that what I should be talking to you about tonight would be just like my uh, view of the election, because we're 40, 52 days out, and, and what, you, what you, I might provide by way of minor insight um, into the next 52 days. Uh, that you haven't discerned for yourself. And there might not be much, but uh, I will say, first of all, um, from that front row, sometimes if you're watching C-SPAN and you're seeing me listening to the president, I am drawing him. Uh, <laughs> and I want you to know that I am doing that, and I am not pretending to be doing anything other than that. Nobody's asking me what I'm doing. You know he has a mole right here. and I, <laughs> Right? And he's gotten... Couple parentheses right here. Cal talked about the double parentheses that he developed over the last couple of years. So I am drawing him. Um, but before I, I, I do that, I did want to say I know that that we've honored this weekend uh, Ali Farzat and Asim Trivedi, and I wanted to say in addition to honoring them, I do think uh, it's worth a moment just to to thank uh, whomever you want to thank uh, God or whomever fate that we live in a country we, we don't have to worry about that, where I can say whatever I want to say on air. Uh, well, maybe not me, but, 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 but you can draw whatever you want to draw, and as long as your publisher will publish it, you're not going to be stoned, you're not going to have your hands broken, you're not going to be thrown in jail, and it is magnificent that we do live in a country that allows those freedoms. Um, but moving on, um, giving you just a very basic view of, of how I'm viewing the next 52 days and why... Uh, people ask me, this election feels so small. Why is this election with so much on the line? We know so, much, uh, so many important things are going to be decided after uh, election day. And, so many, and these are two very different visions for the country that Mitt Romney and Barack Obama uh, are offering. Why does this election seem so, so trifling? And I think one of the reasons it does um, is you have to step back and look at uh, the 2008 election. Now, right now, conventional wisdom might have Obama with a slight edge. Um, there were a couple polls that came out uh, Friday from Marist, and I know uh, some people don't think some people think the polling uh, is skewed these days. Um, so I'm not saying that they are what they are definitive. But in, in key states, um, uh, Florida, Virginia, and Ohio, which really are, if you had to narrow it down to three or four states, I would say those three in Colorado. Uh, where Obama does have a lead. Now, he does not have uh, a 50, he has not reached 50%, which is really such, obviously, the, the crucial number to reach, but he is ahead of Mitt Romney. So until those last persuadable voters who have not decided yet, who are not happy with this president, but are not yet sold on this other guy, until they decide, we won't know. But it does seem that, that the conventional wisdom at least has it, that, that, uh, that Obama has a slight edge. But the reason I think this election seems so small uh, is because of how tight the election last time really was. Now, it doesn't feel like the 2008 election was tight, um, but let's just, if you just step back, as my friend Jay Carney often says whenever I ask him a question about how horrible things are, let's just take a step back and look at 2000 
eight. And Barack Obama had a lot of things going for him uh, in those closing days, a wave of support and popular support, um, an economic crisis that, that at the time seemed to play to his strengths and John McCain's weaknesses, some gaffes by John McCain, uh, a running mate selected by John McCain that in the end, according to polling, hurt him more than it helped him. I mean, Barack Obama even won Indiana, and that's a state that three years ago they were telling me they knew they were not even gonna try to win this time. Um, but Barack Obama, even with all of that going for him, won 53%. And the White House will tell you uh, off the record that, uh, ooh, I'm waiting, I'm, we're off the record here too, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, senior Democrats will tell you that, that uh, <laughs> that Barack Obama's ceiling at 53% is pretty much, that's as, that's as well as he's going to do. He's never going to do better than that in this, in this current state of affairs with the economy still uh, struggling and unemployment still at higher than uh, 8%. So that's as high as he's going to do. He's never going to do better than 53%. John McCain, for the disaster of a campaign that everyone says he ran, he still won 47% of the vote. Now, the final popular vote was 69 million to 59 million, but that really overstates the chasm. It, 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 really, it really wasn't that big of a divide, even though it felt like Barack Obama was swept into office, and numerically he was, 10 million votes, that's a lot. But if 14,000 people in North Carolina voted differently, 150,000 in Iowa, 200,000 in Florida, Ohio, Colorado, Virginia, and 300,000 in Minnesota had voted differently. So that's a million plus people, not 10 million, a million plus people. If they had voted differently, Barack Obama would have won the popular vote, but he would have lost the election. And, and if you'll permit me one dorky electoral aside, one of the reasons why there are a whole bunch of Obama campaign staffers right now in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, do we have a cartoonist here from Omaha, Nebraska? Yeah. Do we have, is there a newspaper in Omaha, Nebraska? <laughs> So um, if uh, that was a state of the journalism kind of thing, it wasn't meant as a slam on Omaha. So it, it, Omaha, Nebraska is one of two states, Maine is the other one, that awards its electoral votes according to congressional districts. Barack Obama, last time, anticipating a possible 269 to 269 tie, sent voters to, I mean, sent uh, campaign staffers <laughs> A meme is born. That was a, mis that was a misstatement by me. Um, sent campaign staffers and money to Omaha and won Omaha, won that one electoral vote. It wasn't ultimately in the end needed, but he did win it. It didn't get a lot of attention because he didn't need it because he won, he won the electoral vote so handily. It's not going to be that close probably this time, so they are doing it again. So there is, there is a whole staff there in Omaha trying to win Omaha, just Omaha, not the state, just Omaha, because it is very possible if you take the states that I mentioned, and if you flip Florida, Ohio, Colorado, Virginia, and North Carolina, give them to John Kerry, I mean, Mitt Romney. <laughs> these are not, these are actual uh, gaffes. These are not, these are not intentional. <laughs> if you flip Florida, Ohio, Colorado, Virginia, and North Carolina, give them to Mitt Romney, and you allow President Obama to keep Minnesota and Iowa, you get 269 to 269. There are any number of scenarios like this. So that's my one little dorky aside about o o Omaha, or as staffers in Omaha call it, Obama. Um, that's an in case of emergency break glass kind of strategy. But that's why this race sometimes feels so small, because they're not competing to win this nation. They're competing to win the 1.2 million people I told you about, uh, just the few, the 14,000 in North Carolina. Uh, and the others. And that's why when the Obama campaign, and I could do this for the Romney campaign, but I'll just do one, when the Obama campaign looks at this race, they talk about the auto bailout, not because uh, it means anything to voters in Virginia, but because it means something to voters in Ohio. And it's micro-targeting. They're looking at these small little swaths of people. And that's why when Sandra Fluck gets a speaking role at the uh, at, at the Democratic National Convention, or they talk about contraception, they're not trying to win over uh, Steve Kelly in Louisiana. They're, 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 tra they're trying to look at women in Northern Virginia or women in Shaker Heights, Ohio, who might be ambivalent about President Obama. They're not really excited about him. They don't really think the country's better off, but they really don't know about this other guy, and they're just trying to feed into that. Uh, and you see that with millions of dollars of advertising. This is the second election cycle 
uh, since I've moved to Washington in, in 92, the second election cycle that I've gotten to see these campaign ads uh, because Virginia uh, is, for the second time, a swing state. And it's really amazing to see. Uh, I feel bad for the, uh, for the chip box of the world who are besieged with campaign advertising every four years. It's, it's amazing how you can't, you can't watch anything without hearing about Mitt Romney, believe, you know, that kind of thing, that voice. Um, I, I, at this point, I'm like the undecided. I don't like either one of them. Um, in places with, uh, obviously, with uh, important Latino populations, and this cannot be overemphasized, um, this is why uh, you see there, there, um, in 2010, there was a wave, and it swept over Senate races. It swept over House races. I remember um, covering the election that night and talking to people at the White House, and they were just talking about how the election returns came in. It really was, and I don't mean to be callous about an actual natural disaster, but it really was like a tsunami or a wave sweeping across the country and just sweeping Democrats out of office. And it went Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio. And you, you, they would, for, in a lot of cases, for the guys in the White House, uh, who I talk to all the time, these are, these are friends of theirs, these are people who took tough votes, and they watched the, them just let be swept out of office. But there were a few places where that didn't happen, and one of them was Colorado, and one of them was, unbelievably for Harry Reid, Nevada. Now, Harry Reid was under 50 cent, uh, 50 percent, um, did I just say 50 cent? Uh, he was under 50 percent approval in Nevada, and yet he won, because Latinos, uh, in addition to having the opponent he had, Latinos uh, turned out remarkably for him, very strongly for him, as they did for Senator Bennett in Colorado. And that's why Latino voters are, are, are such a big part of this election cycle, um, even though probably for most of us, we don't even discern that it's going on. Mitt Romney is running ads on Latino stations talking about the importance of a bipartisan immigration reform, which is not the same ad he ran in Iowa and New Hampshire, I'm pretty sure, uh, earlier this season. So, and that's why you have these little pissy things like um, Barack Obama going to Iowa and telling jokes about Mitt Romney putting his dog on his roof so that we cover it. He knows that Cable Catnip uh, can't, you know, finds this, uh, uh, you, you, can't, um, you have to cover it when, Mitt Rom when uh, Pre President Obama makes a joke about Mitt Romney putting his dog on his roof. But they honestly feel that ambivalent voters who do not like Obama but are not sold on Mitt Romney might hear the story about him putting the dog on his roof and that might actually, if they have a dog, be a, a deal breaker for them. I, I'm not joking about that. That's why this has even emerged as a campaign issue. They've been talking about this since the beginning of the year. Um, now, Romney has been doing this too. Um, I don't know that his micro-targeting operation is as advanced as the Obama one when Jim Messina left uh, his position as deputy uh, chief of staff for the White House before he became campaign manager, he went out to Silicon Valley and talked to the late Steve Jobs and talked to a whole bunch of people about the best way to do this. And um, I think it's possible that their operation is, is more advanced. But, you, but Romney's doing it too. Uh, and you see more, it's more general. It's more for older voters you, in Florida. He'll talk about Obama cutting Medicare. Uh, for, for white working class voters, there's that ad. Um, however factually accurate it may be, about uh, Obama gutting uh, uh, work uh, requirements for welfare. But generally, Mitt Romney's argument is, is a broader one. It, generally, his belief is the economy is bad, then the American people will hold the president accountable for that. The problem for Mitt Romney is that there are other factors going on, and, that, and, and right now, and it might change, but right now it does not seem that that has sealed the deal. That has not been enough. Uh, Romney, according to polls, is the least likable Republican candidate since Nixon. Um, and now, that might not be a fair and accurate representation of, of who he is and whether or not he's getting a fair shake, but as we all know, uh, this is not a fair and accurate world. Um, and uh, so that's been a problem. Barack Obama has a, a he's much higher percentage when it comes to likability, much higher percentage. More importantly, when it comes to cares about the, the needs and the, the problems of people like you, which is much more. Whenever you hear anybody on TV talking about how likable Barack Obama is, they don't know what they're talking about. That's not important. What's important is what do the polls say about how much voters feel he cares about their problems. That's much more important. And right now, Obama's double digits over, over Romney on that. 
So I remain unconvinced right now that this is over, even though I feel like a lot of people are starting to worry, a lot of Republicans are starting to worry uh, that it is. I had lunch with a very distraught Republican uh, earlier this week, uh, and he was just tearing his hair out and said, unless Romney can, can just like give Obama a punch uh, in the, not literally, in the uh, first debate um, and, and knock him out, uh, that, that, he, that he fears this is over. And there, there does tend to be kind of a wave and self-fulfilling prophecy type thing when it comes to these elections. And Obama right now is leading in who do you think will win, which is a different, I don't know when people started polling on things like this. Who do you like, who do you think is gonna win? But in any case, most Americans feel like Obama right now is going to win. That ends up sometimes being a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's still 52 days left, anything could change. And especially with unemployment above 8% and millions more looking for work, I, I don't think that this is a done deal. We are entering a home stretch. We have debates, the October surprise. I'm not sure what it is yet. Maybe you guys have gotten the memo. Uh, I'm hoping it's not a, a nuclear war between Iran and Israel, but there is, as there is always something that's gonna happen that we're not anticipating. The previous two challengers who defeated incumbent presidents, Reagan and Clinton, both entered this final stage of the race with a lead. And that's not where Mitt Romney is right now. So he still can win, and it's still possible, but he would be uh, going against historical trends. So that's my basic take on where this race is right now. Uh, again, I don't think anything's over. It's just a, this is a snapshot for this exact night, and anything could happen between now and when I wake up tomorrow morning. Because one time I drew a picture, because you're, you're sitting on the tarmac for hours, and you're bored, and you know, so I, you, know, you draw a lot. You doodle. You, so I drew... Um, a cartoon of snakes on the plane. Um, and it was Barack Obama saying, get these mother blanking reporters off my mother blanking plane. And he's uh, holding a gun. There are all these snakes with the ABC logo and the CBS logo, the New York Times logo. And I gave it to him. And he was like, this is, this is pretty good. <laughs> and he hung it up at the front of the plane this is like prime. This is like during the primaries. This is, you know, he was still Senator Obama, so it was up there. I don't know where. I'm sure it's thrown out by now. But I think that um, the, I don't have an answer to your question. But those are my two. Those are my. Those are my two car tuning story. Yes, sir. You want to draw him right now for us? Yes. You know, but yes. all right.